All right, I think we've got a fun episode today. Last week I sat down with my good friend Nate O'Brien for about an hour. And Nate's one of the OG finance YouTubers. He's been around since about 2017 when the niche was really first being created. And now he has 540,000 subscribers and is growing at an insane rate. He gets about 40,000 subscribers a month. I think it's a really insightful conversation for any person or brand looking to get started on YouTube, so stick around. Sweet, so I think just to start, I wanted to hear like what made you decide to start doing YouTube, right? Because you started when you were 18, I think I heard you say in one of your videos. Yeah, I was, I was 18, so it was, it was, uh, it was essentially my, my New Year's resolution for beginning 2017. Um, but starting YouTube, you know, I think a lot of people who start on YouTube, they sort of sit on the sidelines for a while and they watch other people grow YouTube channels. And then eventually after so many years, I just kind of got sick of watching other people grow their YouTube channels and then saying, you know, what, I, I could probably do something similar to this. So, you know, I, I grew up on YouTube. I'm sure you did as well. Right. I mean, it was founded in 2005. So I was seven years old at the time. Um, so growing up on YouTube and then just watching so many people blow up on the platform, uh, it just looked like something that was, there was so much opportunity in it. Okay. And then what made you pick finance? Cause I feel like, like, obviously it's a fairly large niche on YouTube and it's not really like, it's ruled by a younger demographic. There's like yeah. you, meet Kevin, Graham, Stefan. Yeah. They're like, and like, I think Kevin and Graham are like 27, but you're, you know, how old are you? 20, 21? I'm, I'm 21. Yeah. I'll, I'll be 22 next month. Um, so it's really interesting because the, the finance niche on YouTube did not exist a couple of years ago. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a, just a, a crazy thing to think about. But if you go back to 2016 and if you would search anything about investing or personal finance or saving money, making money, any of that, it, there would be a couple of videos. It'd be like some old Investopedia videos that would have maybe two minutes long. Um, and there really wasn't a finance community on YouTube as there was with something like the blogs, which, which blogs have been around for a long time. So there's a big community there, but the, the finance community really started in just the past couple of years. Um, and it's, it's been growing crazy levels now. I mean, if you look at the, the top finance YouTubers today, uh, like Graham Stephan and me, Kevin, and those guys are getting about almost a million views per day now. Um, and that just wasn't really possible like a couple years ago. Um, so yeah, uh, why I started with finance was because I think everybody has something that sort of makes them tick, right? And for some people, it's music. For some people, it's art or expressing themselves through some other uh, form. But for me, I love numbers, right? And so the easiest way to to relate numbers to real life was through finance and and through crunching numbers. And sometimes I feel bad for my accountant or or some other people. I I feel like I'm talking their ears off, but I could just talk about finances all day. I I just love numbers, and so it, it was so easy to relate that. Um, and so that's why I realized it'd be great to start talking about finance on YouTube, um, because if you try to pick a topic to go and make a YouTube channel about, and you're not passionate about it, like you couldn't sit around a dinner table and talk some talk to somebody all night about it, then it's it's probably gonna fail. And that's just from my experience because I've tried to start channels in the past about tech or about different areas and they just never worked out because I didn't have that motivation because I wasn't passionate about those topics. Yeah. And I think that makes sense. I think it's just, to me, it's weird. Cause like I wasn't passionate about finances till I made money, you know? So <laughs> yeah. like for me, it was more of like a, like now I would say like, I'm fairly passionate. You know, I own a couple rental houses. I invest in the stock market, like tax, like you said, like you work on your tax strategy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like and I don't know if you went to school, but I went to college for a few years. And so like when I was 18, it was more like, you know, like which party are we going to? Tonight? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. I mean, that's how I was as well, you know, but like, um, so when you think about just pe people's hobbies, like, like when you were 12, what were some of your biggest hobbies? <laughs> yeah. See, so like when I was 12, ooh, probably just like video games and sports. That's yeah. pretty much okay. up in the country. So like, which I, you would think it means outside, but more just like there's nothing to do ever. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so was that like you, like when, when did you start liking finance? Did you notice it in middle school and high school? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, it, it's as far as I can remember back. Um, and it's, it's really not like a, a, a connection with money necessarily. It's, it's, it's not greed. I, I really don't care about money. I just love 
the numbers behind it. Um, so even if I was working in somebody else's business and I was just crunching numbers for them or, or marketing for them, I, I would love doing that. Um, I, I just think it's the way that, that my brain is wired. I, I, I just enjoy numbers so much. So it, it, it's really as far back as I can remember. You know, um, I, I started buying stocks in 2009, which, which was kind of a weird time because I was, I was 11. Um, and that, that sounds really weird to a lot of people because like, they're, they're like, what's wrong with this guy? Or he had a trust fund. Uh, I did not have a trust fund. It was, it was that because this was during the recession, there was so much news about the economy and the stock market. And, 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 and so I would sit around at like family dinners and Thanksgiving and I, I'd hear my uncle talking about it. He's a mailman. Um, he'd be talking about it with my grandfather, talking about stocks, getting into stocks. And then I was just naturally curious about it. So I convinced my parents to help me open up an E-Trade account, which was actually pretty easy to open up. You know, when, when an 11 year old kid asks their parent, hey, can I start investing? Most of them will say yes. Um, so, so they were happy to see that. And then I just started to learn over time just how to invest and read so many books and really just kind of got into it more from there. Yeah. And that's, I don't know. I think, I think it's definitely a cool, it's a cool hobby and it's like, it's also a very yeah, yeah. responsible hobby, you know? Yeah. And it's, I mean, as long as it's you're not, fun. Like, yeah, yeah. Unless you're like on, unless we find out there's like a dark side where you're on like wall street bets on Reddit, just <laughs> Yeah, just, the attendees, gambling, just gambling. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. yeah, that's just gambling. <laughs> that's it's literally, yeah. My, um, my father-in-law, that's what he talks. Like every time someone brings up the stock market, he just immediately starts talking about options and how they're yeah. gambling. Yeah. No. So the thing with, with, with the way that I invest is, is the biggest key is to minimize risk while maximizing potential reward. So it's all about mitigating risk and ensuring that you're, you're keeping this, this steady growth rate or as steady as possible growth rate rather than going all in on a company or shorting a company, having a massive position that that's over overwhelming. And then suddenly, you know, something like coronavirus occurs and then suddenly you're out entirely because you were too heavy into one specific stock or industry. Yeah, no, I think, and I think that makes sense. And it's like a cool, it's kind of cool to me how much information there is on there. Cause like, yeah. So I didn't know, like, I literally, you know, like fell into money. Like we started an e-commerce company and started doing really well. Like all I knew was like, you're supposed to spend less than you make. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden like Robin hood comes out and it's like, Oh, I can just download an app on my phone and invest money. Like, and then I can go type in on YouTube and like someone like you is going to teach me that, Hey, like you don't need to look up 300 random companies and be doing all this stuff. Like yeah. grab yeah. a two or three index funds, or I mean, even just one, if you just like S and P 500, obviously, but you know, and so I, I think that's kind of a cool thing that you're leading the way. in. cause I mean, I really can't think, are there that many other finance YouTubers besides you three? Well, I'm so so there's sort of different waves of, of people. I think we're probably on wave three of finance YouTubers where the first wave was really 2016, which is when we first saw the first people emerge. So Graham Stephan, he had, you know, 10,000 subscribers in like 2016. Uh, financial education, I don't know if you've seen his videos. Uh, Ryan Scribner, uh, Meet Kevin started around that as well. And then there's wave two, which would be people like me. Um, I started in 2017. Um, and uh, Marco from Whiteboard Finance, he's a good guy, he's a friend of mine. Um, and, and now I would say that we're in wave three now where there's a lot of finance channels that have maybe a couple thousand subscribers, they're just getting started, but there are thousands of people who have a couple thousand subscribers now in the finance niche. So I think it's gonna continue to blow up for sure. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it's kind of that next evolution, right? I think you see it with all forms of content because yeah. like, you said, like blogs are big and actually like I have some friends who are very large bloggers, none of them in the finance niche, but like, and you know, they just print cash, but I feel like you see <laughs> yeah. blog, like blogging or a niche gets big in blogging, starts to get a lot of audience. And then over time you'll see it migrate to things like YouTube is people. Cause like people love that visual content and it just gets easier yeah. and easier to create, you know? Yeah. And it's not to say that, that, that blogs are, are dying, but I, I think that a lot of the bloggers that I talk to, um, so there's an event uh, that's called FinCon. I'm not sure if you've heard of it or, or not, but essentially all of the finance bloggers, like the biggest ones, Bankrate, NerdWallet, and uh, uh, most of the finance blogs, they go to this conference. And a lot of the bloggers, I mean, they're pulling in some pretty large numbers, you know, a couple million dollars a year at, at a minimum for some of the large ones. Um, and a lot of them are very interested in YouTube because they're starting to see some of their blog traffic is 
not necessarily starting to, to die down, but it's, it's, it's definitely sort of plateauing. And they're looking at the amount of views that people on YouTube are getting and, and they're starting to shift over there. But I think it's, it's sort of important to have both. You know, if, if you're just on YouTube, YouTube one day can decide, hey, we don't like Nate O'Brien anymore and we're not going to show his videos. And it's, it's so easy to do that when somebody else is really in control of your brand. So that's important. Yeah, no, I think, so does that like, is that something you're working on right now is oh, yeah, content totally. diversification? Yeah, content, uh, uh, content diversification, but also even with your brand diversification, you know, not putting all your eggs into one basket where uh, let's, let, let's take the brand of, of Nate O'Brien, right? Um, my, my YouTube channel. There's, there's a couple things that could go wrong with it. One is that one day YouTube says, hey, we, we don't like Nate anymore. We're not going to promote him. Uh, the, the other possibility is that just people won't be interested in what I have to say, you know, two, three years down the road. It's, it's probably going to happen. So the, the problem that I see with a lot of influencers today, I don't like calling myself an influencer, yeah. but I suppose I am. The, the problem with influencers today is that they, they get big on a platform and then they, they quit their job, they drop out of college, they do all these things. And then a couple years later, their traffic slows down. They're not getting as many views because somebody came along who's better than them, smarter than them, more entertaining than them, and they're not getting views anymore. And then, you know, five years later, they go back to work in a 7-Eleven. And I think that's what happens to a lot of influencers. If you just kind of look at that cycle from influencers, let's say the, the biggest YouTubers back in 2007, right? Where are they today? A lot of them had to go back to getting jobs because, you know, they, it, it just slowed down. So it's, it, it's important to think about the future and make sure that you're diversifying outside of YouTube. Or if you're not going to diversify outside of YouTube, at least make sure that you're saving as much money as you can from this YouTube expedition so that you, you have a nice nest egg to, to kind of go off of later in the future. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. So like Utah has, it has a surprisingly large YouTube culture. Really? I think that's what would shock many people. We actually are one of the states that has the highest million subscriber channels per capita. Wow. But what you'll find is like, so you'll go to these like meetups, right? Like you can go to a YouTube meetup and have like, you know, 15 million subscriber YouTube channels in a room. And yeah. like you're, so that the total population, I think is like two and a half million or something, you know, like that's like four blocks where. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but some of the guys you'll see there, like they have these huge channels, but, or they have a lot of the time, especially in Utah, you'll see, we meet a lot of people who they don't actually have huge channels as far as like subscriber numbers, but view wise, cause they were big on YouTube mm, yeah. before subscribers were even like a real thing. Like yeah. you could subscribe to channels, but like it wasn't a big push. So like, I don't know if you've ever heard um, this one. I know I can say, but I won't say too many other ones cause I don't want to like <laughs> bad mouth people, but like kid history, if you ever saw those videos growing up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they, yeah, they throw a, like a, youtube video marketing conference in utah because they're all from like provo where brigham young university is um and they literally their channel like they have videos with like i don't know the exact numbers but, like 10 million views on a single video you know and <laughs> yeah. if they put out a video now they literally can't get like ten thousand views yeah and, and so, that's the way that it works yeah because especially like um so over time youtube has really started to water down how much they they uh, way the amount of subscribers that you have. So yeah, back when they were popular, if you have a million subscribers back in 2010, um, and you put out a video, a lot of your subscribers are going to see that they're going to push it out. But now I I've seen channels that have 500 subscribers and they'll get a hundred thousand views in a day because it's something that was just really, really interesting of a topic. And then I see channels with a hundred thousand subscribers and they'll get 200 views in a day. Right. And it's, it's so, so subscribers, it's, it's just kind of this number that people just use for, for clout. Um, and it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really mean that much. It really doesn't. Yeah, no, I think it definitely makes sense. Yeah. But like, it's just, it's an interesting thing you're breaking up. Cause like we, you literally see it all the time in Utah. Like we'll go to events and someone will be like, Oh, there's so-and-so he's so cool. He's got this big channel. And then you find out, like you said, he's got a day job and yeah, yeah. drives like a, like, it, there's nothing wrong with driving like a, you know, like a beat up Nissan or anything, but when you <laughs> do it because you literally like her, yeah. you know, bottom 30% of income, even though you have this huge <laughs> yeah. following, but I think it surprises people. I think we're, we're actually seeing that with like other platforms as well. Like for example, Instagram, the people who blow up on Instagram back in, let's say 2014, 2015, they might still have a million followers. But when they make a post, they get, you know, a thousand likes for a million followers. And I think it's going to happen with TikTok as well. People who are blowing up on TikTok now, it's, it, they're, they're viral right now. They're doing well now. 
but there's going to be times in the future where they might have 5 million followers and they put out a TikTok and they're only getting, you know, a couple thousand views on it. Yeah, no, I think I think it's the same way. And especially cause like TikToks, especially so hype based and oh, yeah. they have some things I really don't like. Like, I don't know how familiar you are with their ad platform, but it's actually only, they only offer one day attribution and you have to prepay for huh. your ad credit. So oh. it's not like Facebook where, you know, you put your credit card in and they bill you like every $50 if you're, yeah, and it's yeah. To kind of like one of, um, I think our company, it's like two thousand dollars is when they bill us. You know, TikTok. Like, huh. if we want to spend twenty thousand dollars, we have to pay them twenty thousand dollars before we can even think about it. Yeah, that's like, strange. Obviously, at that number, you would be doing it. But then also, when you're only doing one day attribution, it means like, if someone literally doesn't purchase from first touch, like, your whole platform looks like it doesn't work for advertising when like most products, you know, take multiple touch points. So yeah, I think there, I think that's one that's going to be, I'm interested to see where it goes, especially cause like the way their algorithm works where they're not pushing to follower content, you know, it's much more of that like algorithm. Yeah. Feed. Yeah. I'm, um, yeah. It's gonna be really interesting. I, like I'm not, I haven't been following TikTok's uh, finances too much, but I, I would imagine that they're, they, they really probably are not profitable right now. Yeah, no, I don't think so. With the all. amount of people using it and then the amount of, people advertising on it. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I doubt they're profitable. I don't, yeah, I don't follow their finances too much. We actually have the Patrick and their designs channel. We have like one of those TikTok partner managers where like we got on early enough that even though our, I think we only have like 60,000 followers, we have like a person at TikTok we can text and like <laughs> ask algorithm questions to. And we just did it because we were interested in like, like, you know, like we're not really going all in on TikTok. Like we're not Gary Vee. Yeah. All in. <laughs> yeah. But we were just like, but it's just, it's interesting to me. Um, I want to pivot a little because like, I think what surprises a lot of people when they talk to YouTubers is they don't realize how much of an actual job it is. You know, they oh, think yeah. It's, yeah. it's all fun and games. They're like, oh, Nate comes up with a video, sits on his couch for 10 minutes, <laughs> throws it in um, some, I don't even know, like, <laughs> Windows movie maker and is, has his video uploaded in 25 minutes. And that's- yeah at the week's work. So like, I want to, I kind of want to hear stuff about that. Like what's a day like in the life of Nate O'Brien? So, you know, so it really can be that, that life that, that people think of where you can sit on your couch all day and then upload a video randomly. I have done that before. Um, especially when I was in college, when I first started the channel, I mean, I was, I was, you know, going out partying, just having fun with my friends. And like once a week, I would just go to the, the a, a random classroom at two in the morning, film some videos randomly and, and, and put them out. Um, but yeah, if, if you really want to see a, a pretty decent amount of success on YouTube, then yeah, it, you have to treat it like a full-time job. Um, I would say for my personal brand, I probably put in 60, 60 to 80 hours a week just for my brand. Um, and it's, it's hard to measure it because it's, it's not like you're going in and with, with a nine to five, right? But it's something that's, if, if you're passionate about it, it's just always in the back of your mind. It's always running. You know, you know, you're cooking some eggs and you're thinking about the next video idea, right? Like it's, it's all the time, 24 seven. You wake up in the middle of the night, you're just like, hmm, this would be a great video idea. And you just have an epiphany at the, at the strangest times too. You know, sometimes you're at, say, like a party, right? I remember when I first started my channel, I'd be at a party and somebody would say something and I'd get this genius video idea and I would just leave. I'd have to go back and script it out and write it because I, I had to get it down on paper so I could just make that video the next day. Yeah. But, yeah. but productivity is something that I'm, I'm really passionate about. I think people just waste so much time in their day and they have all these big plans, these big dreams or these tasks that they want to do. And then at the end of the day or the end of the week or at the end of the year, they look back and they say, wow, I didn't get very much done. Then they set their new year's resolutions. And then it, it goes back into that cycle of not being very productive. Okay. So I, I know productivity is pretty big. You make some videos on that. What's mm -hmm. like your, what do you do that you feel, what do you do that you feel helps your productivity the most? So this is actually something I don't see many people doing, but I know this helps me so much. It, it's your phone, right? Your phone people spend so much time on their phones. I think there's been studies about this um, and, and I put those studies in one of my videos, but people are spending close to five hours per day on their phone, which you know that's, that's almost a quarter of your day spent on your phone. And while you can be productive on it, I think just this social media vortex of scrolling through Instagram, scrolling through YouTube, uh, scrolling through all these different platforms and Facebook, and it, it just kills your productivity, especially when you have notifications on. I, I turned off notifications on my phone probably two years ago 
Um, I don't get notifications. I get text messages. That's it. Um, but I, I also just don't give out my phone number to people. Um, but Instagram, Snapchat, all of those notifications, they're all off. And so there's less distractions. So I think focusing on your phone and limiting your phone usage. And for some people, that means that you might have to put it in a different room, put it under airplane mode. I mean, I literally got a cook, like a, a locking cookie jar. I had it in my uh, minimalist apartment tour video and uh, it, it locks and you can set a timer on it. So you say, I'm going to lock this up for the day. And then you, you cannot use your phone. I, I don't think people would go to that extreme. You can probably just put it in a desk drawer or something, but turn it off. And you know, the biggest problem that people have with that, they say, well, what if somebody needs to contact me? What if somebody needs to contact me right now? They have an important message or somebody's calling. And I found that just doesn't really happen. Um, and if it's a true emergency, they will find a way to contact you. You know, they'll call your neighbor and say, hey, can you go knock on Nate's door and tell him this bad news or something, right? But for the most part, I, I think phones are the biggest distraction for people. Yeah, no, I think I see that all the time. Like in my life, I'm definitely like, I probably spend an average of five hours a day on my phone, which like I check. So I check all my emails on my phone and mm -hmm. I probably get, you know, I probably get a hundred emails a day and at least 20 yeah, of them like, need to be read. Yeah. So, you know, like that's probably like half an hour there and some other stuff, but I know like a couple of those hours are like, and like, I can pretend they're productive. Like, Oh, I'm on Twitter <laughs> talking to other marketers, but like, I, I'm not getting anything really out of it besides like maybe a little bit of a connection, but like, it's mainly me just wasting time. So like, I definitely relate to that. I'm a big, like when it's go time, I turn my phone off, throw it yeah. in my pocket and just sit at the and work. And I think it's a, I think that's a big help. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt this video, but I want to let you know it's sponsored by faucetdigital.com forward slash newsletter. That's the newsletter for my personal consulting company. It's where I'll give you insight on, it's where I'll give you insights on all kinds of business strategy things. It has the same information and insight I give to seven and eight figure e-commerce brands and influencers like Nate when I work with them. I dive into how we spend $100,000 a month marketing budget, things like that every week. So if you want to check it out, it's faucetdigital.com forward slash newsletter. The link's on your screen. Um, you mentioned your minimalist apartment tour. And I kind of wanted to jump in on that minimalism thing. Cause that's like, um, if you like looked at my lifestyle, you would be surprised to find that I spend a lot less money than people assume I do. It's just, there's like four or five things I spend stupid amounts of money on, <laughs> but I know you're big on minimalism. So like what kind of got you into that? So just the way that, that I function in my life is that I feel when there's clutter everywhere around me, there's just something in my brain that, that makes my brain feel cluttered as well. I just need a clean place to work. I don't think it's OCD, but it's, it's, I, I, I need a very clean place to work um, with, with as little clutter as possible. But also, honestly, I just find that I don't really need that many items. You know, if you look around uh, when I go over to people's houses and, it, and it's not to say that, that I am right and they are wrong. Uh, it's really just a matter of preference. But when I go over to people's houses and you just see, there's no other way to put it, but just trinkets, like ornaments. Uh, they have a plate hanging up on their wall. They have just random pottery and things that I personally just don't really see any value in. Um, but once again, that's, that's not to say that, that you know, people shouldn't have that. It's, it's, it's up to that person. But I just find it's, it's so much, I have so much more mental clarity when I have fewer things. And also it, it, it has a convenience factor to it, you know, um, where when you have a cleaner apartment, I, it's there, there's fewer things to clean right um yeah. and it's, it's just all around better and also when when you move apartments because i move around all the time i mean i'm, I'm 21 i i want to get you know try out different places to live in the world and it's super easy to do that when you can just throw everything in a car and drive away you know no yeah i think that i think that makes sense because i feel like it's like i'm by no means like like i'm not you i'm not alex becker i don't <laughs> i'm not like a minimalist at all but I definitely feel that because like, so that's a point of contention between like me and my wife all the time is like, she's like, we should buy throw pillows. And I'm like, why? You know, yeah. Like, I don't need a pillow for decoration. I need a pillow to lay on. Like if it's, if it's to look at, I don't need it. Yeah. But, yeah. So I kind of, I definitely feel that. Um, bring up, do you watch Alex Becker's videos ever now that he's kind of in that like minimalism I saw that he did get into minimalism. Yeah, I was, yeah, that was interesting, actually. Um, I, I don't know if he started making those minimalist videos before me or if he started after me. I think but after. It was I think it very was. close, but I think it was right after. Yeah, well, there was a big trend. Like, so um, everybody sorts of like makes trends 
on YouTube. And, and the biggest person who started minimalism was, well, he didn't start it, but kind of blew it up on YouTube was obviously Matt Diavella. Um, and then I saw his videos. I, I was an avid viewer and I said, Hey, Matt did an apartment tour. I'm going to do an apartment tour too. Um, and then I, I did it. My minimalist apartment video sort of blew up. I think I was like 1.7 million views or something. Um, and then all of the other finance people like in my area were like, Hey, Nate's video did well. So then they all made apartment tours as well. So, but, but that's just the way that it works on YouTube. You know, like if, 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 um, if, Graham Stephan puts out a video tomorrow and he gets 10 million views on it. He's number one on trending. There's a good chance I'm going to make a video really similar to that video because you know it works. And that's the thing with YouTube. You don't want to reinvent the wheel entirely, but you also don't want to copy people. You know, there's a, there's a nice balance there. Yeah, no, I think so. I don't know how familiar you are with like Alex Becker and what he does, but um, mm -hmm. I'm actually, I'm one of the, like his new SaaS companies. Um, our company is one of their clients. So like we've, like, I don't know him personally very well, but we've chatted with him and I think he just went through like a coming to Jesus phase of realizing yeah, he definitely. didn't want to wake up and be Ty Lopez. Yeah. Yeah. He, I saw that he was, I think he was getting away from like selling online courses and everything. But then I, I also did see an ad for one of his courses uh, <laughs> yesterday. It, it was, it was, a, it was a YouTube ad about yeah. YouTube ads. Like it was, yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, no, I think what he pivoted to is like, I don't know. I could dive into it. Cause like, I think he's a, very good marketers oh, and so i yeah. study him all the time but like he realized that he obviously he like wants money he feels like he needs less of it now when he's trying to start like a SaaS company but he just didn't want to be selling make money online so his yeah. goal like the like they're pretty good at weeding you out because like you'll talk to they'll like facebook message you and look at your facebook before you can get on a call with them at least mm -hmm. for their other company they do and so he claims that it's it's only targeted at people already doing, you know, like six figures and revenue in their personal life. And it's just a way to like have a side income off his personal brand without actually feeling like a scumbag for, you know, yeah, yeah. trying to like convince people to get into <laughs> internet marketing. Yeah. So, so th th that's, that's, I mean, I have, I have some pretty strong opinions about some of like the, 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 the make money online courses that you take and then you learn that the best way to make money online is to sell make money online courses and then you just start to sell those. And then, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really, uh, that, that's one of the reasons why I don't sell any courses. I make all my money on the back end because I don't want to charge people for things. But that's, that's not to say that you can't do it. You know, I mean, I, I have friends who sell online courses that really create some really good products, you know, so, but there's, there's definitely... A, a good amount of bad apples in that industry as well. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's really what it comes down to in that industry is there's like, it's hard to cut through the noise because there's so yeah, many. Exactly. And, it, and like the barrier to entry is so low, you know, like, especially yeah. it's like the same as YouTube. Like if you can film a YouTube video, you can throw up a landing <laughs> page and be like, buy my course yeah. on how to sell click funnels. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but I just thought that was funny because I saw him, I think I saw, like, I discovered both of you right around the same time because I've actually, I'd seen a couple of your videos back when you were really small. Like, not, like, that sounds rude, but, like, no, we have, like, 70,000 subscribers, which a lot okay. of people are going to be, like, small, but, like. I, was, I think that was, that was probably 12 months ago then, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about a year ago, and I'd seen some videos, and then it was really funny. So, like, I'm in a group um, of, like, Facebook, or I'm in a Facebook group of YouTubers from Utah, and. I had recently rediscovered you because I was like, I've seen this kid before and he's like blowing up now. And then that's how we got introduced is one of my friends who's in a different Facebook group was like, Hey, this person's just wants to know if anyone can get him some brand deals. Like if you want to talk to him. And so yeah. that's when I reached out and met you, but I just realized it was like, just a funny thing. It's like, I watched your minimalism video and then I was like, Holy crap. There's like a whole minimalism community. Oh, yeah on oh, YouTube yeah. and I didn't even know minimalism was a thing. So, yeah. Well, the, so the one thing that I will say about minimalism with, with uh, on YouTube is that the demographics are totally different from the finance people. Um, so, and so really I have a couple different types of people who watch my videos. The biggest people are, are the finance people. They're learning about investing and personal finance. Then there's also people who are just interested in minimalism and they subscribe for the minimalism videos and the primary demographic it's uh, Europeans uh, who are about 29 or 30 years old and primarily female, which is f totally different from my finance demographics, which is the average age of like a 26 year old, uh, guy from America. Yeah, no. And that's really interesting that I, I watched 
doing like research, I watched some of your videos and I know you touched on this, but that probably plays a huge factor on your AdSense revenue, right? Cause like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I know you like your finance videos get killer CPMs. And then I didn't know what minimalism would get. I kind of, before <laughs> I saw that video, I just assumed your minimalism content was just in like the same advertiser pool as your finance content, just cause it seems like every, I've really only seen you and is Matt the guy who he does minimalism content, but he also does passive investing or dividend stock investing videos. Um, no, that that's not Matt. Matt, okay. Matt, Matt Diavella is, is just minimalism and productivity and like sort of lifestyle okay. videos. Yeah. So I watched some other YouTuber who did minimalism videos and then dividend stock videos too. Like, bit like exclusively dividend stocks investing. Okay. And so I just assumed I was like, that's like the thing, like financial YouTubers and minimalism, like apparently they're all folk. Yeah. I don't think they're, I don't think they're as connected as, as what like uh, you might've thought, but like, I think it was just, um, you know, when, when I put out my minimalism video in, and then all the other finance people like sort of tied in the minimalism thing as well. And that's not to take credit for that because I'm, I'm not a pioneer of minimalism in any way. I mean, I, obviously it was Matt Diavella and then before him, there were other people as well, but um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, it's kind of, it's like you said, like it's a big part of YouTube culture is like not, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but you want to take other people's content ideas and be just similar enough that you know, like the video is going to be entertaining and hope that you'll get recommended by the people who watch exactly. the next video. Yeah. And so like, yeah. like we do it all the time with like, Oh, we'll do it with like collaborations a lot. Actually, we'll we're like work with a channel that will release two separate videos to try to get both videos to suggest. So like, if you hit it big, it you, you go from like instead of a one million view collab video, you have two one million view videos, one yeah. for each channel. But um, I don't know if you want to jump into that, but like, how what's the difference? Wise like, does finance YouTube pay like ten times more, four times more? What would you say then? Um, so I'll tell you that uh, I was looking at the total ad revenue from my minimalist apartment video. Um, I was looking at it a couple of weeks ago and I think it was, well, actually I can pull it up right here. Um, but I, I think it was probably like $5,000 for 1.7 million views in my pocket, which I think is probably like the standard rate that a lot of people on YouTube are getting. I mean, the CPM I think was maybe eight or $9. Um, and then YouTube takes, I think 55% of that, or no, YouTube takes 45%. I get 55%. Uh, uh, let me pull it up actually just to, to check. But compared to the finance videos, my average CPM for finance videos is, is over $20. It's, it's somewhere between $20 and $35. Uh, obviously, the, the pandemic has hurt CPMs a little bit, but probably about 20% or so uh, CPM drop that, that we saw, but they're starting to level out from, from that. Yeah. No, yeah, because that's it's interesting because like, so in the DIY niche, you're looking at like a four dollar CPM from YouTube. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I've, so that's yeah, and I think it's 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 just because um, I mean, when you think about the people who are running ads on my finance videos, and this is something that like sometimes when I would talk about the CPM and why my ad rates are a lot higher sometimes people would, would call it BS and they'd say, there's no way this is true because you know, they looked it up on social blade and they saw that the average CPM is like two or $3, no. but it, you, you have to think about who's advertising on your videos. And so for a finance video, I, I'm getting advertisers from banks competing with brokerage firms and other financial institutions and mortgage companies and, you know, Quicken loans, turbo tax. And so there's these massive companies that there's so much money in finance that a company like chase might be willing to pay. $400 to land a new client. Right. And so they're going to run so many, so many ads and bid for those ads. Cause that's the way that YouTube ads work. You know, it's, it's, it's bidding on them. Right. Yeah. And um, I think, oh, I sorry. Think, oh, you're good. Go. Yeah. No, I was going to say, uh, you, you probably can't see that, but it's like, yeah, well, sorry. Uh, my I, webcam I is like on the it. bottom, but it's, it's yeah. $5,034 from 1.7 million views on the minimalist video. And those, those ones, I mean, when you just think about the title, like I'm talking about not buying things. So who the hell would want to advertise on something where I tell people not to buy stuff, you know? So, so that's why the, the CPM on that is a lot lower. No. Yeah. And I think that makes sense. And I think it's like you said, I think that's one of those things that a lot of people don't understand is that, um, like how the YouTube ad marketplace works. Cause they just yeah. assume like, Oh, YouTube is paying these people. 
but it's no, it's like companies like, like you said, Chase and, you know, Chase has lifetime value of like in the thousands of customers, oh, sure. customers you yeah. know, like if you open an account with them, like they don't even care about you opening a savings account. They like want you to get a mortgage through them and things like that. So exactly. they're like, we can, we can afford to spend $25 per thousand views to get our ad seen. Whereas like, like you said, the minimal, minimalism videos or like, especially my go-to examples, like when you think of like the DIY niche, cause that's like where most of our really close contacts are like who think of like a company that sells like hand tools. They don't advertise on YouTube. Cause like that's an industry that's just a generation behind. Like I hate yeah, exactly. Group, yeah. Like, you know, like Harbor Freight, we talked to Harbor Freight <laughs> one time cause we wanted to, we use their lathes a lot in our shop. So we were like, Hey, why don't you just like give us, we buy, we buy like eight lathes a year. They would definitely get seen like 10 million times. Like, why don't you just sponsor us just with lathes? Like you don't even have to pay us money. And they told us, they're like, we don't even have a digital marketing department right now. And wow. we're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, well that's, yeah. Well, well, Harbor Freight's primary customers is probably, yeah. Like, you know, people who aren't buying the products online either. I mean, I'm sure that most of their sales come from in-store too. Yeah. And they actually, I think they're kind of like McDonald's where a lot, they actually make a lot of money, I think from their like real estate by oh wow like getting stores and um, yeah, Patrick knows a lot more about that part than I do, but he talked to me about it one time. It was very interesting. They have like this very weird real estate arbitrage way that they make money. And so like, it's more worthwhile for them to open a new store. And even if it fails, then to just continue the current model. And I think it has something to do with like the debt they can get and all this stuff it's, it's very, it was like a very unique situation. I'm not educated enough on it to talk about it, but yeah. they're like, they're definitely a weird model. Um, that being said, I know you were telling me a little while ago that you were starting to get into affiliate marketing. And so just for people who see this, that don't know what affiliate marketing is, that's where someone promotes products and receives a commission for promoting products to their audience rather than an upfront fee. Um, what kind of got you into the affiliate marketing side of inner, like, I guess being a YouTuber, right? Yeah. So, um, blogs primarily make their money through affiliate marketing. Right. Um, and so just kind of transferring that over to YouTube. So for example, if, if I'm making a video about, uh, how to save money, right? Like I have a couple of videos about how to save money. I think they've, I don't know if they have a million views, but probably seven or 800,000 views. Um, and in one of the videos, you know, I'll say, uh, it's important to open up a high interest savings account or to find a way to with, with your money so that it's not sitting in a regular bank account or under your mattress losing value because of inflation. I say, hey, just put it into a high interest savings account. Um, I'll leave a link down below for a bank that you can use to open up a high interest savings account. And then every time somebody clicks on that link, and then it tracks that person who, who clicked on the link and it could be 60 or 90 days later. Uh, are you good? Sorry, there's a very weird noise that I have no idea where it's coming from. I apologize. Oh, okay. you can hear that. oh hopefully That's it's good. not from from my end. Is it from no? My it's end? like a drill. It's like someone's like okay. drilling the concrete. Right. <laughs> I was All like, right. yeah, a, yeah. Sorry. Um, okay, um, I think where I was, but I was saying that. Um, so if, if if somebody clicks on that link, then and then it could track them for thirty or sixty or ninety days. And then let's say that two months later, if that person decides, hey, I'm going to sign up for this bank account that they clicked on that link through my video, then I will get a sort of a kickback or commission from that bank, which could be, you know, $100, it could be $200 or more in a lot of cases. And you can see how that works. You know, if you have a video that got 800,000 views and from those 800,000 views, you had 2000 people click on that link, which is a pretty low rate, but let's say that 2000 people click on that link. And then from those 2000, let's say that 50 of them sign up for a bank account and you're getting $150 per bank account. That's what, that's probably $7,500 in commission from that bank, right? So it's, it's a great way to just make some extra money. But the biggest thing with affiliate marketing is that uh, to, to really make sure that you, you keep a high level of, of integrity and that you're not promoting crap products. And that's why it, it kind of gets a bad rap sometimes from people because there's people out there who are these little like affiliate weekend warriors that just go out and like spam affiliate links everywhere. <laughs> um, and that's, that's not cool. So the, the biggest suggestion that I would have for that, for people who want to do that is just make sure that any product that you're promoting as an affiliate is a product that you use yourself or that you've, you've tried yourself or that you've at least seen good reviews about it. And you know that it's a good quality product. Yeah, no, I think I like the phrase affiliate weekend warriors. Cause like, <laughs> I know 
I know. Oh, I see like a lot of those. Like I'm in some of those like Facebook groups. Are you just like someone is like yeah. spamming in the chat, like go click my link to get this. And you're like, yeah, please stop. Um, and that is and the worst way to <laughs> make money with affiliate marketing. Cause it's not scalable. Just like pasting your links and like Quora answers and stuff. You, like it's important if you're going to do affiliate marketing to either do it through f- free content through like YouTube or blogs or even creating your own Facebook group. Cause then you can pin it to the top. But if you're just going onto forums and yeah. spamming your link, like you're, you're not going to get clicks cause like nobody clicks on sketchy links from forums, especially today. Yeah, no, it's, it's weird. Actually that was, I wanted to bring that up because so one of my first like in-person meeting of like a finance YouTuber was you wouldn't know him. His, I mean, maybe you do, but his name's Spencer Meekum. He's an affiliate YouTuber. Now he owns a channel called build a preneur and it's really small. Actually. It's like 16,000 subscribers or something. Sound, sounds so familiar though. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I have seen his stuff. You probably have. He's one of the, like, do you know anything about like the click funnels affiliate like yeah. stuff? Yeah, so he's one of the like Dream 100 car guys where he's like ClickFunnels pays for his car payment and he's he's gotten that multiple times. So like they pay for multiple cars in his family's house. But wow. he got to start, like he discovered affiliate marketing when he was like in college and he was just like a young dude. He was, he was telling me about it. And what he did is like, he was just making like, kind of like doing what you were here, you know, like spamming like Instagram DMs, like, <laughs> hey, go sign up for yeah. whatever like whatever it was then um and he made a youtube video one time just randomly just because he's like i bet i could make a youtube video and it was how to open and i don't know what the brokerage was but like how to open an e-trade account online or something. yeah yeah and then he had a kid and forgot about it for like six months and it happened to just be like one of those videos where it just like happened to it ranked and it got like fifteen thousand views and he came back and he had like three grand waiting yeah for payments. and he was like it happens you could make like I could make YouTube videos. And so he does like a lot of really like niche or niche YouTube stuff where like using like Google ads and things like that, where like makes a video, runs it as an ad and relies yeah. on the fact of the clicks. But like, it was just really funny. Cause like he kind of, he started on the same path you did, but he went the complete opposite of like, instead of like, Oh, I could just make good finance content. He's like, Oh, I could just like do pure affiliate marketing and, yeah so 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 he's he's mostly doing it through through paid ads then yeah he's he's big on paid ads and like he's one of those guys who has like he's got like a facebook group with like ten thousand people in it now you know and like yeah yeah thirty thousand forty thousand person email list but his youtube traffic like he wouldn't he's he's not like a youtuber you know Mm -hmm. by anyone's metrics except that's what he uses video content very heavily in his affiliate funnel so like he's got a lot of content on youtube it's just not super growth oriented content it's all like very niche yeah um but that makes sense um do you have like a do you have like a goal like a 10-year goal like where do you want to take nate o'brien the brand or even the person so you know to to, to be honest with you i think my long-term goal is definitely not to be a personal brand um i think that there's something there's something that a lot of people don't really think about when so all right so when you are, when most people are younger, they think, hey, it'd be really cool to be famous or not that I'm famous, of course, but, but, or, or, or to be recognized when you go places. Um, but I have to say that there's a lot more downsides to it than I think I initially would have thought. And, you know, today, if I walk through the streets, which really in 2020, I mean, the streets are closed, but um, previously before the lockdown back in February, like I was in New York and I got spotted like five times in, in like a two hour span. Um, and that's just from that, that's just from 500,000 subscribers, like for the people who have 5 million or, or 10 million subscribers, I could not even imagine how many people just like come up to them all the time. And I don't know. So, so you sort of lose your, like that, the, the fact that you're anonymous, you lose that. And I think people take that for granted. Like when you can, like you can run down the street naked and nobody knows who you are, right? Like there's, there's no problem. Um, but when you kind of have people with eyes on you, there's just more room for, for a lot of issues to come up from that. So yeah, from my, my 10 year plan, I'm, I'm going to start phasing out my personal brand. Probably, probably once I hit a million subscribers, just to kind of get that, that million mark, um, phase it out, focus on some other revenue streams. It's, it's sort of just like a chapter in my life. That's it's fun. Um, but I, I don't want to be 
too big to the point where it like you need like security or something you know like you think about some of like the big big youtubers like pewdiepie like his house gets robbed uh, he you know like when he goes to an airport he gets people coming all over like you know so there's there's a certain level to which i, I want to grow it yeah do you know what like and like obviously you don't have to say anything if you like if it's secret but like do you know like what you would want to pivot to as far as less personal branding Definitely something with, with marketing or finance and hopefully both, you know, um, there's, there, there's so many, there's just so much opportunity out there. And I have been venturing into a number of different areas that, you know, I'm not going to go in, into detail on all of them because some of them are, are pretty competitive. Um, but yeah, like just, I've been taking some of my revenue and funneling it into some different projects and ventures and, uh, but yeah, something in finance, hopefully finance and marketing, because I, I love marketing. I love getting the attention, but I don't necessarily want to be the face of the attention. So more so of a brand that I can be behind. Oh yeah. And I think that makes sense, right? Like I think it's something people, like they almost take for granted because everyone's like, oh, I want to be a big personal brand. And like, if you can build a big personal brand, it's very like valuable. Like I mm -hmm. have almost no personal brand and like you know, I like, I make a really good income and everything, but like, I can't, I don't have a big audience at my fingertips, you know, that I can just go tap if I have an idea. So like mm -hmm. you lose out on that. But like you said, like I can go somewhere and no one knows anything about me until they know what I've done. And so like, yeah. if, if I don't want to say it, or if someone doesn't ask, like, they're just like, Oh, and not that I've like done a lot or anything, but just the difference of like, if Patrick goes somewhere, they're like, Oh, I've seen him. He's he's got a YouTube channel with 730,000 subscribers. He's like a YouTuber. And yeah. Like and then, and yeah. like, no one even knows, like, they're like, Oh, you like do something with him. Right. And like, yeah. And that's like <laughs> the end of the conversation. Whereas like, we'll go to like, not high school reunions necessarily, but like see kids from high school. And they're kind of doing that. Like they're like mobbing him and I just get to hang out over by the side. And I'm like, yeah, like, Oh, I like make just as much money and do lots of other yeah. stuff too that you don't get like, because no one knows that no one bugs me about it. And it's also, it's honestly really nice. I, honestly, I, I, I do envy that. Uh, uh, maybe the grass is just greener on the other side, but um, you know, I think I would much rather be wealthy and have nobody know about it because then, you know, like if you have millions of subscribers, people, people know that, yeah, you're, you're probably pull, pulling in some money. And then you also just attract the wrong type of people, you know, the people who are trying to climb the social ladder, people are trying to use you for things, gold diggers, you know, you get all of that uh, once it starts to grow a lot more that, that can be kind of negative. No, yeah. And I definitely, I agree. Like, I think there's the, I think like you, you hit the nail on the head. Like there's, it's always greener on the other side, but it's like, they have their pros and cons, right? Like the biggest thing is like the attention that you can get can obviously like slingshot some of those things in your life. Yeah. But at the same time, like, you know, like in my case, at least like I work behind like a veil, but I still like, I know people who can introduce me to you. I'm like really good friends with Sean Kelly from Jersey champ. So mm -hmm. like I can, like, if I really wanted to, like I could get someone on the phone, they're just not going to know who I am, but I can yeah, like, get yeah, be the connections. Me. But yeah. yeah, so like it, it That's still perfect. works out really well. And I definitely get that it's, you know, like it's definitely would never want to be recognized in the street. I think it's, it kind it's, of it's a little weird. Yeah. I mean, like there, there, there've been a couple of times where it, it was like, just strange. Like I, like I've had people like follow me around like multiple blocks and then like, like later, like later that night they would DM me. And this, this is like at like 10 30 uh, at night in Philly, I'm walking on the streets and there's this guy walking by like a hundred feet behind me. And I kept taking turns. I was like, this guy's still following me. This is weird. And then he started yelling, hey. He's like, hey, hey. And he was yelling at me. And I was like, this guy's probably trying to like mug me or something because it was, it was the middle of the night. So then I dipped. I turned the corner. I dipped. And then he messages me like 30 minutes later. He's like, hey, I just saw you. I'm a big fan. Like, just wanted to say <laughs> hi. But it, it was still like, just a little bit weird. But, you know, honestly, though, there are a lot of benefits to having a, a pretty sizable personal brand. I mean, like when I was in Barcelona, somebody recognized me and I said, Hey, actually, now that you're here talking to me, could you take a picture of me real quick? For my, you know? So like, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah like there, there are a lot more benefits than there are downsides, but the only point I want to make is that it's important to make sure that you think about those downsides before yeah. you kind of go through that journey. No. Yeah. Especially. And because like, and it's also like you said, like you're, you've got your head on your shoulders really well and everything like you're, at least as far as I know, like you're not out there yeah. doing anything crazy, but Thanks. 
if you, you know, a lot of people could see like the antics that some YouTubers do that get them very large, like Logan Paul, Jake Paul, all the guys in like the FaZe Clan, Rice Gum. And if you try to emulate that and you're a 200,000 subscriber YouTuber who's, you know, making 40 grand a year and all of a sudden something goes wrong and you have to go get a job and now there's these videos of you doing like really <laughs> bad antics. Yeah, yeah. Like it definitely can have a major negative impact on your life. And, and I'll also say that pe- people love to build you up so they can tear you down. Like they're just waiting, especially in, in 2020, in today's society, people are just waiting so that you can slip up, you can say the wrong word, you know, you're on a podcast with somebody and you accidentally say one word that, that's not good. And then suddenly your career's over, you're getting torn apart on the internet, you end up on, on you know, drama alert with Keemstar or something. And it's just like, so, so it's important to diversify outside of your personal brand, or at least so that if something happens, you know, like one day, it, it, it happens almost to everybody, there's gonna be controversy, I'm gonna say something that doesn't vibe with a lot of people. And, uh, you know, so you always have to be prepared for, for those times in the future. Oh yeah. That, I think that definitely makes sense. And I think that's the perfect segue into the, the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on because thinking about the kind of like people need to think about the future if they want to get into this life mm-hmm. or want to try to build a personal brand. I kind of was wondering like, what's the advice you would give to someone if they want to start a YouTube channel, whether they're like a person or a company that wants to stand, start a branded channel, any of that, like what's your, What's kind of like your go-to advice on getting started? Okay, so there's, there's three big things that I could say. One of them is don't try to reinvent the wheel. Just look at the people who are crushing it on YouTube. Look at like Mr. Beast, right? Somebody who's growing so fast on YouTube. Look at what they're doing. Every little detail, how long are his videos? You know, you see that they're about 13 minutes. He makes those that long for a specific reason because he knows that YouTube likes that length of video. You look at the thumbnails, you look at what's working for YouTubers, start to really, really analyze it and dig it apart instead of kind of just randomly throwing videos out there. Because if you go onto YouTube today and you just make two minute videos, like what people were doing back in 2008, which was working for two minute videos, if you make a two minute minute video today, you're probably not gonna succeed. That's not to say that you will not succeed, but you have a, a lower chance of that because YouTube likes that longer form content now. So looking at other people, not reinventing the wheel, but also I would say there, there, there's two things you could do. It's, it's news jacking and fame jacking. So a great example of this was I, I know a couple of people who had no subscribers. They started making videos recently about the stimulus package and uh, uh, the different things that are going on in the economy right now at the moment. And because there's so many people interested in it, they're getting on the trending page like every day. And they had literally no subscribers to start with. So find things to tap into that are in the news that people are interested in right now at the moment. Um, and then there's not that much content on it. Right. And so that, that's a great strategy. Um, and then also, you know, just, just push through with, with the videos that you're making. Cause a lot of people will make a couple videos and then they'll forget about it. Right. Cause they don't see that instant result. Make at least 20 videos, make at least 30 videos before you actually give up on it. And for me, what I had to do to get myself to do that is I literally had a credit card. It was, it was this, it was a discover card at a $500 limit. And then I bought $500 in Amazon gift cards, maxed out the credit card to buy my camera for my YouTube channel, and then had to find a way to pay off that credit card and I was like, well, I better make at least 500 bucks to pay off this credit card on YouTube. So that was kind of like an ultimatum. I don't know if I'd recommend that to people, but that's what I had to do to, to make sure that I was able to really stick through and kind of start growing on YouTube. No, I think, I think that's some great advice. Where, where's the best place to find you, obviously? Um, prob- probably, well, obviously YouTube, but yeah. um, if, if you want to contact me, uh, best way is honestly through Instagram. Just follow me on Instagram, DM me. That's I, I try to read through most Instagram DMs or you could just email me to um, nate at nateobryan.com or you, know, you can find my emails online as well. All right, sweet. Thank you, Nate. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I thought that was an awesome episode with Nate. He shared a lot of information on what it's like to be a YouTuber. We're going to have new episodes out every Friday. Um, some of the ones coming up are Scott Paul. He's a VC and owns a company called Wooly out in salt lake we have the guys from the water jet channel on the schedule we have a couple of other large e-commerce store owners from utah who i think are going to have some awesome insights if you enjoyed the video be sure to like and subscribe or follow if you're listening to this as a podcast 
Just remember these videos are sponsored by my agency, Fawcett Digital. And if you want to get some really actionable and behind the scenes information on what's going on in the digital business landscape, you can check out our newsletter at fawcettdigital.com forward slash newsletter. Have an awesome day.